The First World War, also known as the Great War, was a global conflict that lasted from 1914 to 1918. It primarily involved the Allied powers, including France, the United Kingdom, Russia, and later the United States, facing off against the Central Powers, including Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. The war began with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary in June 1914, triggering a series of alliances and escalating tensions. During the Second World War, Germany's attacks were notorious for their intensity and strategic innovations. They employed aggressive tactics such as the Schlieffen Plan, which aimed to swiftly defeat France before turning against Russia, and the extensive use of trench warfare and use of chemical weapons. Germany's unrestricted submarine warfare, including the sinking of the Lusitania, drew the United States into the conflict. By the end of the war, Germany had inflicted significant casualties on the Allies. The war resulted in significant loss of life, with millions of soldiers and civilians killed or wounded. It had far-reaching political, social, and economic consequences, including the collapse of empires, the redrawing of national boundaries, and the eventual emergence of the League of Nations, a precursor to the United Nations. In the aftermath of the war, the Allies decided to impose harsh conditions on Germany through the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. The eyes of the world were focused on the Palace of Versailles. The business at hand was the treaty to end World War I. This decision stemmed from multiple factors, including a desire to punish Germany for its perceived role in starting the war, demands for reparations to cover war costs, and a belief that crippling Germany militarily and economically would prevent future aggression. The treaty's punitive measures were intended to maintain long-term peace, but inadvertently fueled resentment and economic instability in Germany. The Treaty of Versailles blamed Germany for the war and made them pay reparations to the Allied countries for the damage caused. They set an initial amount of $33 billion in 1921. The treaty allowed the Allies to take action if Germany didn't make payments on time. To prevent Germany from becoming a military threat again, the treaty imposed strict limits on their military. They could only have 100,000 soldiers, banned certain weapons like tanks and submarines, and limited where they could make weapons. The area west of the Rhine River and 30 miles east of it had to be demilitarized. The Treaty of Versailles, which the German delegation received in May 1919 and reluctantly signed in June, faced strong criticism from the Germans. They believed it was forced upon them and imposed unbearable economic burdens. Germany's resentment grew due to hefty reparations and the war guilt clause. When Hitler violated the treaty by remilitarizing the Rhineland in 1936, the Allies' lack of response further emboldened German aggression. Despite the tough limitations imposed on Germany to prevent its resurgence, how did Germany manage to regain significant power and influence? While there are a lot of reasons politically, socially and psychologically, the treaty imposed very harsh terms on Germany, including territorial losses, military restrictions, and heavy reparations payments. Germany lost significant territories to neighboring countries, its military was limited in size and capabilities, and it had to make large reparations payments to the Allies. These terms were seen as humiliating by many Germans and fueled a sense of injustice and resentment and the reparations payments slapped on Germany after the First World War were like a huge financial weight on the country's shoulders. It caused a lot of economic problems, especially when hyperinflation hit in the early 1920s. Hyperinflation was when the German currency lost so much value that people's savings and wages became almost worthless. It was in this environment of hardship and despair that radical political ideas, like those promoted by Adolf Hitler, and the Nazi party found a receptive audience. They promised stability, national pride, and a way out of the economic misery, which appealed to those who had suffered the most. During the chaotic times of the 1920s and early 1930s in Germany, things were pretty rough. The economy was in shambles, partly due to the hefty reparations from the Treaty of Versailles, and this led to hyperinflation, which basically made people's money worthless. Jobs were scarce and poverty was widespread. This economic hardship left a lot of people feeling frustrated and disheartened. At the same time, the political scene was a bit of a mess, with frequent changes in leadership and a sense of uncertainty. The Treaty of Versailles, from the German point of view, wasn't just a loss in a war, it felt like a deep humiliation and a raw deal. 
It wasn't easy to swallow the reparations they had to pay, the land they had to give up, and the restrictions on their military. Instead of just accepting defeat, many Germans felt their pride was severely wounded, and they held on to that sense of injustice for a long time. This resentment didn't go away. It grew stronger over the years. So, a lot of Germans developed a strong desire for revenge, a burning need to make things right and, most importantly, to overturn the treaty they saw as unfairly imposed on them. In this atmosphere of anger, hopelessness, and uncertainty, radical political movements like the Nazis found a receptive audience. They offered seemingly simple solutions to Germany's problems, like restoring national pride and bringing back order. This mix of hurt pride, the feeling of being victimized, and the hunger for payback became a powerful force in German politics and foreign policy. Germany's strong belief in its own superiority and its historical destiny combined with the deep desire to correct what it saw as the severe wrongs of the Treaty of Versailles, led to a dangerous overconfidence. This inflated confidence in their abilities, along with the strong desire to regain lost prestige, played a significant role in the rising tensions that eventually ignited the Second World War. Finally, the challenging economic conditions and the prevailing perception of a weakened government in Germany during the early 1930s created fertile ground for the ascent of authoritarian leaders like Adolf Hitler. As the economy was in shambles and unemployment soared, people were desperately searching for strong leaders who could provide stability and a solution to their profound troubles. Hitler, with his charismatic oratory skills and ability to channel the collective anger and frustration of the nation into a compelling vision of a resurgent and powerful Germany, resonated deeply with many Germans. He presented himself as a charismatic savior, promising a restoration of national pride, economic recovery, and a return to greatness. This resonated with those who were weary of the political instability, economic hardship, and a sense of humiliation caused by the Treaty of Versailles. The treaty imposed severe restrictions on Germany, but the lack of strict enforcement of these provisions by the Allied powers contributed to the treaty's ultimate ineffectiveness in preventing the resurgence of German power and aggression. As a result, a significant portion of the population looked to Hitler as a beacon of hope in turbulent times, ultimately propelling him to power and solidifying his hold on the country. Germany is on the rise again, both in terms of its military capabilities and the strong will of its people. After overthrowing the monarchy through revolutions, the people of Germany unfortunately found themselves drifting back toward authoritarian rule due to these unbearable problems and difficulties they encountered. In the lead-up to the Second World War, the way countries perceived each other played a big part. Germany, feeling increasingly isolated and like it was surrounded by enemies, started seeing other nations as less than human almost like monsters. Many among them genuinely felt that their country had been treated unfairly by the international community, giving rise to a potent us-against-the-world mentality. This psychological shift made it easier for them to justify their own aggressive actions and to push their nationalistic agenda. This process essentially makes it more acceptable to harm or oppress others. In this case, it helped pave the way for war and made it easier for Germany to commit terrible atrocities because it created a mindset that made other nations seem less important and their rights less significant. After the Second World War, the Allies, like the UK, France, and the USA, had a big challenge on their hands with Germany. They wanted to avoid the mistakes of the past, like the harsh conditions imposed by the Treaty of Versailles after the First World War, which had contributed to another war. So, when it came to West Germany, which they governed, they took a different approach. The Allies decided to invest in the people. They put money into education, healthcare, and infrastructure to boost the education and economy of West Germany. Their idea was that if people were economically stable and well-educated, they'd be less likely to support extremist ideas or start another war. By creating a prosperous and educated society, they hoped to ensure that West Germany would be responsible and less likely to cause trouble. Plus, it was a time of intense rivalry between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union, so shaping West Germany as a democratic, economically successful, and peace-oriented nation was also part of their broader strategy during the early years of the Cold War. When the Soviet Union took control of East Germany after the Second World War, their approach was deeply influenced by the immense damage and suffering that Germany had caused during the war. The Soviets saw East Germany as a critical buffer zone and a way to prevent any potential future aggression from Germany. To achieve this, they implemented strict measures, including demilitarization, taking control of industries, suppressing political dissent, and aligning East Germany closely with the Soviet communist ideology. 
This wasn't just about ensuring security, it was also about preventing another conflict like the one they had just endured. In a way, it was a form of payback for the suffering they had experienced during the war. And of course, in the Second World War, Nazi Germany caused immense damage to the Soviet Union, resulting in approximately 26 million casualties, including 10 million military deaths and 16 million civilian deaths. Cities and infrastructure were severely damaged, with Stalingrad and Leningrad being particularly hard hit. The war disrupted agriculture and industry, leading to food shortages and economic hardships. Millions of people were displaced, causing significant upheaval. Among the nations involved in the Second World War, the Soviet Union bore the highest human cost, with approximately 26 million casualties, including military and civilian deaths. Guess I've covered the key facts about how the Treaty of Versailles contributed to the outbreak of the Second World War and lesson that just punishing a country doesn't guarantee peace. It's important to also address the reasons behind their actions, make sure everyone has a stable economy, and promote talking and working together to avoid more wars. And I do hope that this example can often apply to individuals in their personal lives too. Just like how punishing or oppressing someone for their past mistakes may not help them grow, but has a possibility to turn them into a worse person but teaching them what's right and wrong. Guiding them towards becoming an educated, informed, and compassionate person can be far more effective in helping them become a better human being. And that understanding that seeing others as enemies can be dangerous is also crucial for keeping peace.